Um, so good afternoon, everybody. I think it's a little busy afternoon for everybody um, today for some reason or another. So um, I am Dan Bullock. I'm the co-chair um, of the committee. I'm currently CMO at National General Hospital. Um, so just want to welcome everybody. I know it's been, I think this is our first meeting in the middle of this COVID era. So our lives are quite different than they were when we last met. Um, so my hat's off to everybody who is you know, having to make changes and do different things um, currently, but we're going to try and keep it moving with this committee and, and do as much as we can. Um, so just a few updates on my end, not a whole lot. I, won't, I know we've got a lot of people that have to jump off. Um, a lot of moving pieces like everybody else's hospital, um, keeping up to date with guidelines, you know, constantly changing, changing recommendations, um, potting off COVID areas, um, how do we isolate people, you know, taking clinics up, down, telehealth, um, elective procedures, stopping, starting. So lots of moving pieces, um, but just like everybody else, we're shifting and evolving as we need to. So um, all is well, otherwise here at Nashville General, we're currently resuming all of our normal operations. Um, starting to see our ED volumes go up a little bit as well. And definitely our hospital admissions are, are up um, a good bit, um, I think in light of COVID. Um, so I won't take a whole lot more time. I know we've got kind of a modified agenda. I do want to take a, the next few minutes and introduce Dr. Michael Caldwell. Um, he did, I believe, join us in person at the last meeting, um, but he's a new member to our committee. He's Director of Health at Metro Public Health Department. Um, I think with Dr. Caldwell started right when, um, about a week or two before COVID started, so he was um, thrown into the fire very quickly. and. Um, if you haven't got a chance to meet him, meet him, you've probably definitely seen him on TV, around town, and a little bit of everywhere. So, a welcome to Dr. Caldwell. Um, if he is on the line. Um, give him a few minutes to speak. I know he was on the prior meeting with us, so I'm not sure if he's called in just yet. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Caldwell. I don't see him on the line yet. Okay. Um, I believe he's intending to join us for a short time, but, um, you know, oh, okay. speaking of, <laughs> Caldwell just, just joined us. Yeah, no, hey there, how are you? I, I was, uh, I called in, but for some reason I was on mute, but hello. <laughs> hey, it's, Mr. Caldwell. Uh, 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 thank you, it's a, a pleasure to join you. I actually was really pleased to have attended the last ending the HIV epidemic, uh, just as a citizen and uh, meeting. And uh, so I am really uh, grateful for everyone's participation and work that is being done and also recognizing that uh, we have a, a real unique opportunity to carry the ball to the finish line uh, on really ending the HIV epidemic uh, uh, here in Nashville. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of your thoughts about uh, what's going really well now, uh, of some of the progress that's been made recently, some of the challenges we still have, and uh, where are some of the pressure points where we can, if we just worked a little harder or put some more resources or partnered in a different way, we could really profoundly make a, a, a difference. So thank you so much for all of your partnership. You can count on me of being a very strong partner uh, with, with this. I'm an internal medicine physician and I've uh, worked uh, uh, in, in clinical medicine and research and, and public health for for quite some time. I, I uh, started medical school in 1986 and really have seen this epidemic from its uh, infancy to, to where we are today. And I'm um, grateful that we now have it so that it is essentially somewhat of a chronic disease, uh, but it's within reach. We really can uh, eliminate HIV and I look forward to doing that with you. So thank you, Julie. Thank you so Thank much. You, Dr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Bullock. Um, sorry, Dr. Bullock, we do have quorum now with eight members present. It looks like Claire, Will, Brian, Brady, Amna, 
uh, Fahad and Reverend Sanders are all on currently with us. So do you, do you all want to move to the voting? Yeah, we can do that. All right, so um, this is Claire Bold. Sorry, we haven't gotten to do introductions yet, but I'm uh, the co-chair alongside Dr. Bullock. And we have two things we're gonna vote on today. So the first thing is our minutes from the previous meeting, um, which Julie sent out prior to the meeting and um, hopefully everybody has had an opportunity to review those. Does anybody need a moment to look over those? Oh. Okay. Does anybody have any amendments? All right. Um, so the way we're going to do the, the motions and the voting, um, since this is a little bit different, um, if you would like to make a motion to approve, please say your name for the record and then motion, um, also if you're seconding. And then when we vote, we will have everybody um, to the right of your name, um, you should see a little hand icon. And if you click on that, it will show that your hand is raised in approval of the motion. So do we have a motion to approve? So move, this is Amna Osman. All right, do we have a second? Second, glad to hear. All right, and please everybody raise your hand if you are in approval. Julie, are you able to see those? Um, I do not. <laughs> Huh. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's just, it's a lot to navigate on the screen. So I, <laughs> sorry. I see um, Amna, Brady, um, Claire, Dr. Bullock. Um, so that's four. Oh, Brian, I see you physically raising your hand. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you want to physically raise your hand, though. Sanders, got it. Okay. I see at least six of eight, so I think we're good. Okay. And then please, if you did uh, raise your hand using WebEx, please click it again to lower your hand because we're going to vote on something else now. So the other thing we wanted to uh, bring to the council was a discussion about switching from ending the epidemic to ending the HIV epidemic and using the EHE abbreviation as opposed to ETE, which is kind of what we used in the past. And this is a, a relatively minor thing, but it's really um, just comes down to us wanting to be in alignment with federal initiatives that are using the EHE terminology. Um, right now, Nashville isn't. Um, one of the jurisdictions that the federal government is targeting for ending the HIV epidemic, but that may change in the future. And we'd like to be prepared for that and sort of be as much in alignment with that as we can be uh, for the future. So do we have a motion to approve the switch from ending the epidemic to ending the HIV epidemic? Brady Morris, I make the motion. All right, do we have a second? Second. All right, and let's do those hand raisings again. Okay. Brian, I don't think you can do two hands. <laughs> okay. I got some here, I got some here. I've, I see um, Amna Brady. Claire, Dr. Bullock, um, Reverend Sanders, at least five. So we are, we're good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, resume introductions. I think it's, it's your turn, Claire. 
Oh, okay. Um, so I'm Claire Bolds. I'm a program manager for the Tennessee AIDS Education and Training Center. And I have a few colleagues from Vanderbilt that are not on this call today. Um, so I'll be the sort of token Vanderbilt person on the call today, I suppose. Thank you all for coming. Um, Brian is next in alphabetical order. Great, thanks. I'm Brian Hale from Neighborhood Health. Just thrilled to be here and hope you're all doing well. Thank you. Alphabetically, it looks like Brady is next. Hey everyone, Brady Etzcorn Morris. Uh, I am the co-chair of the National Regional HIV Planning Council. Um, I'm not. Good afternoon, I'm Nossman, CEO at CARES. Um, hope you're all doing well. It's good to see everybody. Thank you. Fahad, uh, I think, is next. Hey, everyone. Fahad uh, here from St. Thomas Midtown and West Hospitals in Nashville. Uh, good to see everybody. And Reverend Sanders. Hello, I'm Edwin Sanders, uh, the senior servant at Metropolitan International Church and CEO of the First Response Center. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, also introduce myself and provide a, a few general updates uh, to you all before we move to other updates. Um, so I'm Julie Thacker, uh, the senior health strategist for ending the HIV epidemic with Metro Public Health Department. Um, and though this has been, you know, a challenging time, I'd only met with the full council one time before um, our March meeting, of course, was um, canceled due to uh, COVID. But we're adapting and moving forward and excited about, you know, the potential um, some opportunities that are coming up. Um, just to briefly update you, so the prioritization process that you went through with Judith, she um, provided a, a, a memo or a summary of the prioritization before she left in February, and I, I sent that to you all um, on Monday. Uh, the top five priorities by impact and feasibility were increasing knowledge about and utilization of PrEP and PEP, increasing availability, accessibility, affordability of PrEP and PEP, addressing and reducing stigma and discrimination of people living with HIV, increasing acceptability of HIV testing, and strengthening re-engagement um, for people living with HIV lost to care. Um, also have formed an internal stakeholder group at MPHG to lead the MPHG response to the ETE plan. Um, and have launched with the help of the CDC Public Health Associate, who um, you, you may have met in January, Jordan Moody. She's been pulled into a lot of the COVID response in the health department, but she uh, set up the newsletter for us, which is intended to be a stakeholder letter to provide updates on the work group progress, um, as well as the committee progress, but also to share um, anything that's ETE related um, updates to those stakeholders. So if you all have um, items that you want to share or want to set up a direct contact, your communication staffer, um, whomever within your organization would love to, you know, help share content, um, events and, and the great work that you all are doing. And those are my updates. We also have uh, Brandon Marshall on the line from the mayor's office. Do you want to introduce yourself, Brandon? Hi there. I, yeah, I just wanted to say hello. I think I've worked with or either met most of you guys um, with my role. I am the LGBT liaison with the mayor's office. So I just wanted to join the meeting and see what you all are talking about. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining.
Um, it looks like the next thing to, to move to is the equity work group update. And I'm muting Tariq, who is the equity work group co-chair. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? You can hear me now? All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Tariq Smith, uh, as Julie said. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, my computer, my computer's talking to me. I'm going to make it stop talking to me. Uh, one second, please. I've got some crosstalk. Can you make this stop talking? Thank you. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, I'm Tariq Smith. I am the um, co-chair for our Health Equities Committee. Uh, nice to see everyone again. I'm, I, I, everyone sounds familiar to me. I think I know everyone on the call uh, during from working with you. One way or another, I'm the administrative supervisor for our Meharry Community Wellness Center and our community engagement liaison for our Center for AIDS Health Disparities Research. Uh, that's, I guess, that's about it. I've been working with the with the project uh, since its inception here in in Nashville, and I'm happy to be working with all of you all to move it forward. So, what is our what is our charge, Julie? What are we doing right now? What am I supposed to do? All right, let me flip this slide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Am I getting feedback now? Okay. Um, no, you sound clear to me. Okay. So um, the charge to the equity work group was to prioritize and implement the equity focused goals, objectives, and uh, strategies in the ETE plan or EHE plan uh, for Nashville, um, which includes those that are in goal six area of eliminating uh, health disparities, but also um, certain other uh, objectives that obviously fell within um, the mission um, of the equity work group. So those are included as well um, to guide the advisory council and other work groups in applying an equity lens to their work to ensure that equity isn't siloed into um, one space of this work group, but is applied to all of the work that's being implemented um, to advise on equity performance metrics to the advisory council and other work groups, which was um, what the advisory council asked for the work group to um, do when we met back in January uh, before the work group was formed and to ensure that the implementation of the plan is inclusive, including diversity of persons with lived experience in the highest risk populations. And this holds true with our uh, original charge from the uh, advisory commission too that um, led us toward uh, our, our guiding principles. So this is our equity lens is kind of hand in toe with our guiding principles. So we've been spending a little bit of time making sure that we can spread that around. So um, we wanted to provide So the work was formed in February, but um, was not able to meet physically. So we worked by email uh, during the months of March and April. Um, and during that time, they, the, the work group um, completed a survey to rate the objectives for impact and feasibility to help us, you know, the work group prioritize our work as well, um, which was discussed at the work group's first face-to-face -face virtual meeting, which was on May 7. The work group discussed the possibility of reorganizing some of the priorities and developing additional strategies to um, address the priorities considering the impacts of COVID. Uh, currently, the work group is moving forward with the development of three uh, projects, each aligned with one of the top five priorities of the council, which I mentioned um, at the top of the meeting. And subcommittees are currently being formed um, and have begun work on uh, these projects. So, um, the projects are yeah, right. So, are we, Tariq, do you want me to go ahead and and name the projects? Oh, I'll, I'll jump in really, yeah, really quickly. And so, our our reprioritization process, you know, started early, and it's basically we were looking at our our charge and, and to trying to determine how we could sort of leverage the uh, COVID nineteen response in the context of keeping our uh, priority population on the table. So. All of our recommendations are, of course, in line with the uh, prior recommendations and, of course, uh, in line with our guiding principles, but they are uh, stacked in a way that we 
believe uh, through our feasibility uh, survey, we believe that these uh, these recommendations fit in well with the uh, COVID response criteria, and they kind of help us expand some initiatives that we were moving forward on already. So we we hope to. Uh, let no tragedy go to waste, if you will, and um, end up on some really solid ground moving forward. Can you name the, the three priority, uh, the three um, recommendations, please, Julie? Yes. Um, so, Claire Bolt and, and Dr. Ford from National Cares have, um, and, and myself are pulling together a team for the first project, which is delivering online trainings to HIV and prevention providers to increase trauma informed culturally humble spaces and services. And that um, aligns with the priority of decreasing stigma. Uh, the second, Tariq and I oh, have- let me, let, me, let me jump in, Julie. Let me jump in on the first one really quickly. So um, this is, uh, this is a great opportunity for us. We see it uh, as a great opportunity to really leverage these public and private partnerships. You all know that there are funding, there's funding allotted in certain areas. Uh, and there, we believe that this is a great way to kind of hand tag uh, some of this earmark funding and, and bring in some non-traditional partners to really expand this train to trainer protocol. So we, I know we've got folks in place and this is their area of expertise because this is such a great team. So our hope here is that um, the individual project partners can kind of take the lead in, in these areas and we will be able to uh, secure complementary funding and this one this one especially we think should be a a, a good ask with a, a low-hanging fruit so we we might not have to dip back into the money pot too hard on this one so this is feasible and it's good so thank you Tariq. um the second project uh Tariq and i are working on convening a team uh to uh, look at aligning the hiv testing with the COVID 19 response um to increase testing in at-risk populations and address the objective of increasing the acceptability of HIV testings by um, leveraging those routine screenings such as COVID, but then additionally, we're looking at partnering um, to do screenings for diabetes and hypertension um, in priority communities. Now, this is a really big one for us. If we can pull it off, it's going to be really major. Uh, everyone knows that the workaround on this one is going to be HRSA's 1% mandate. However, uh, uh, TDH uh, isn't, uh, I, I believe in these conditions, uh, there's some wiggle room. Uh, not only that, uh, the state has some money available for HIV testing. So the, the idea here is that as we expand testing throughout, especially Nashville, Davidson County. Um, you know that Meharry is, 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 is on the forefront of expanding a, the testing mm -hmm. initiative. This is an excellent opportunity for us to circle the wagons and um, overlay some of our mapping. This actually taps into some of our other, other uh, objectives moving down the road, but we can overlay some of our mapping and expand our HIV testing protocol along with the COVID-19 and these underserved populations. This is something that was a big deal um, in the original plan. It's been difficult for a lot of reasons up until this point, but we hope to take it once again, take advantage of this crisis, expand and also uh, access. This will bring our faith-based leaders in as they're uh, doing some of this work in, in New York and in Michigan as well right now. So I'm really excited about this one. Uh, if we can get this one moving and shaking, it's, it's something that will yield some some good numbers and I think make a big difference, especially toward our first 90. Thanks, Drew. So, so, so this, is, this is Brian and I, maybe just a couple of clinical questions, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So if, you're, if we're gonna do diabetes testing, presumably that, that's just sort of a blood glucose test and, and that, that involves a finger stick. Um, so that may be a little bit more complicated to do, whereas doing COVID testing, HIV testing, and um, the blood pressure are a little bit more straightforward, maybe a little bit more straightforward. So, so maybe thinking about how to layer in diabetes. But I think the other thing that just makes me pause a little bit is doing diabetes, hypertension screening, and HIV screen, or, um, diabetes and hypertension screening when you're doing COVID screening is, is just operationally difficult because you have to then be in closer proximity to the patient. If you're doing COVID screening, um, you, I could easily see doing COVID and HIV screening together. 
um, but doing diabetes and hypertension, that, that poses maybe a little bit different of a clinical risk. And so I, I totally, I love yeah. the concept. I just, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to, I'm a little bit flummoxed on how to operationalize that. No, very good point. And and we would start um, in the area of HIV. The idea here from the old plan, you may remember, Brian, the idea from the old plan was to normalize HIV testing right. uh, with these behavior related illness business. So that's where we end up with diabetes and high blood pressure. But for us, our focus, our priority population is HIV. So if we can just ramp up our HIV efforts and align our HIV testing efforts with the COVID-19 efforts, uh, we, we would, I, I'm sure, gladly back off of high blood pressure and hypertension, bring it in on the backside. The, 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 the objective here is to normalize HIV testing. So uh, I agree with everything you're saying, and I would argue for the, for the first, I would argue with you and say uh, on your side and, and agree that if we can just tag team HIV testing right now, which is our main priority, we've done a, we've done a, a good service. And, and so I, one of the questions might be to pose, because most of the testing that we're doing um, for COVID are with populations experiencing homelessness or for individuals who are um, living in aged and, disabled, uh, aged and disabled apartment buildings. And so they're, in most instances, they're older individuals who have relatively low risk for HIV. But I could see, like the drive-through settings where they're doing the drive-through testing is there is there a possibility that we could approach Metro? I guess Meharry is now running all of the drive the three COVID assessment centers. Is it is it yes. a possibility that we could um, work with them to do the aura quick tests at the same time they're doing the nasal swabs? I believe so. I'm not. That's above my pay grade. I absolutely believe so. If uh, I know Dr. Hildreth is not on the line right now, but I, I you know he's uh, very supportive of this. Uh, initiative. I, I don't know of any reason why we wouldn't be able to do that. So I believe that Meharry should be equipped and and eager to accept this recommendation and, and move it forward. Gosh, this is really, really smart. Th thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you. This is Claire. Um, I just wanted to add, I don't know what this is going to really look like, but I do know that Vanderbilt's about to start ramping up antibody testing. And yeah. I Vanderbilt's a big, clunky institution. So I wish Dr. Rafani was on because he might have a better idea of how to pair those two things. But it may well be that soon we're doing more antibody tests than we are doing active infection swabs. So that might I think be we've got the right people in play on this one, uh, one way or another. So I, I think that this falls in very well with our uh, expansion initiative as it stands. And I, I don't, I don't see any reason uh, why. Hildreth would be, uh, why, why we might not. But again, this is not, I'm, I'm not allowed to answer this question. <laughs> Thank you all but, for the uh, feedback discussion. Uh, and we'll continue to, to seek out the council's feedback um, as we move forward. These are very much in uh, their infancy. We're just kind of convening the teams to, to talk through how the projects work, but it's really helpful to have your feedback at this point. And is that something, I mean, the council tends to operate uh, on, on its own as well. Brian, is that something you can discuss with Dr. Hildreth? I'm sorry, it's hard to discuss with whom? Dr. Hildreth, I mean, that's who we need to talk about, about that's who we need to talk to about whether Meharry can pull this together. Sure. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I want to be respectful of the chair, but Claire, it, I'm happy to um, work with you to write Dr. Hildreth a note. And then I think maybe it would be appropriate too to say, is there an opportunity to, dis to do some of the aura quick stuff as well at the in any, any sort of antibody focused initiative? Absolutely. Sounds great. Sounds great. Let's do it. Um, so you, one, one thing that but before, I guess one of the risks points here is that we could get everybody excited and the state comes back and says they can't produce on the or on the delivery of or quick testing. Julie, no. do, you, do you mind contacting TDH? And I, I, I'm thinking it's Bob Nelson. I, I'm not sure. But one of the questions I think that, that, that let, let's assume for the moment that that um, the Vanderbilt and Meharry just embrace the idea just the logistical question of how many tests could could Bob Nelson provide and on, on what time frame. So if 
if Julie, if you could make that outreach first, and then once we have a sense about what the capacity, the testing capacity is, then maybe Claire and I can work at, at reaching out to Meharry and to Dr. And to Vanderbilt. Sounds Absolutely, great. and that you know that's definitely one of the in our project charter one of the um, dependencies for the success of this is will labs have the capacity to actually um with all of the increased covid testing so thank you brian um i'll reach out to you so i can get brian's contact because our bub yeah and, and, and julie I'll, I'll send it to you the good thing about the aura quick test is that it's not a lab test so um it's, oh. it's point of care testing and so you don't and it's that that's the real value here is that we wouldn't yeah. be putting more more concern on on, on the lab unless we have someone test positive and then, then we have to figure out the the lab the, the serology that is good to know. Hi, this is Amna. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think it all sounds great in theory, but um, the skill sets of who's going to actually provide all these tests if you have um, you know, a patient there, it takes different skills to have an HIV test if you, you know, get a positive. What does that mean? And the training that is required. Um, to be able to offer that testing and then the linkage to care piece um, should somebody test positive I mean, for any of these. I mean, COVID, we, we know the response right now and, and what occurs, but as it relates to HIV testing, and then also is this going to be provided in a clinical setting or are we looking at, you know, uh, these testing centers that people are going to? So I don't know if there was any discussion about that. So quite honestly, we have, um, developed a first draft project charter and have not yet convened our committees to talk through a lot of these um, issues. So these are um, projects that are in their infancy. Um, we may um, pivot our strategies if these just are not feasible, but did want to at least present the advisory council kind of high level the things that we were starting to work on as the equity work group. And, and, and to Omna, Omna raises an excellent point. Um, we do have a protocol about how to do that and, and, and to make sure that anyone that tests positive links to care. But those are great points. And, and But just to reassure the group, there is a protocol that we, we use on that. Absolutely. Let me ask you, uh, this is Edwin. Is there uh, any data yet that gives us a sense of the degree to which persons in disproportionately impacted communities are taking advantage of the COVID test. Um, I think that uh, that might provide some real insight into whether or not the likelihood of there being, uh, of, well, like the, there are different levels, I guess, of, of initiative in terms of whether it's your first point of concern and consideration that you would go for, uh, the first purpose being the HIV test. Uh, uh, what happens if it's only persons who are concerned about the COVID test? Who are sure. taking of, I'm thinking mm -hmm. about especially in terms of the testing centers that we have now. Um, mm -hmm. Other thing, of course, and I think about this and with the antibody test, I guess, which you're going to initiate from the Vanderbilt side is I think anything that involves any form of um, invasion of uh, you know, any, the, the details of the antibody tests probably get to be an important factor in terms Certainly. of the issue of receptivity to the idea of participating on that level. Um, is that a part, I mean, wait, I guess you said the committee is still going to meet. I guess right. one of the things you might want to do is just make that a part of your consideration. Um, it is, uh, I've been spending a lot of time working on this whole idea of lessons learned from our work with HIV in terms of the application to COVID. And um, it is, it's interesting just in terms of the basic detail. So much of our time and prevention around HIV was spent trying to make sure uh, that we were bringing people up to speed in terms of all the ways in which you could not be infected. Whereas when you think about what we're dealing with for COVID, all the things that we said were not to be done, um, what could not translate into infection with HIV, 
then it turns out to a laundry, to be a laundry list of all the things that you can do. <laughs> yeah. Everything we said not to do, you know, with, with you know, would not be a problem with HIV turns out to be something that is a problem with COVID. So, I mean, we're really, it's, it's, it's a combination of messages and how we deliver those messages and how we, you know, take advantage of the opportunities that we have for people when they come for the testing. And then the question too is who will show up for the testing? So, so Reverend Sanders, to, just to answer the data question, um, right now, Metro Public Health <laughs> is not reporting, uh, they're reporting age and sex information on COVID testing. They're not, uh, my understanding is they're not reporting race and ethnicity data. Um, the other issue with the race ethnicity data that we've seen, because people trying to track this pretty carefully, is that it gets, um, it's a little bit hard to, to interpret because so many of the, the shelter-based, nursing home-based, and um, meatpacking uh, plants have individuals who are disproportionately persons of color. And so if you include those testing events in all of the data, it sort of skews the perspective of who's getting testing. And so I think you're exactly right to look at who's going through the drive-through testing sites and what's the race ethnicity of those people. And that would be a good request maybe to make, Julie could make of Metro Public Health. Yeah. Right, exactly, Brian, because obviously the people at the meatpacking you know, plants and the people in care facilities, are, it is not something they are opting to do necessarily. It's a requirement. Right. Whereas the people who go through the drive through sites for the uh, COVID test are people who are, and that's what I meant about what, what's the basis of the initiative for the person coming to begin with. It gives you, I think, some real insight into whether or not you might be reaching the people who most need the advantage of the HIV test and others. But um, it at least should be a part of the conversation. I, um, I'm, I mean, just uh, this is a total aside, but I have to mention to you that I, I try my best to avoid looking at all the news stories that hit every day. But <laughs> some, some of you all might have seen the one today that says that uh, there have been funds appropriated uh, in the to the tune of uh, 1.5 billion dollars to figure out how you would test 300 million people. Uh, not test, but uh, allow 300 million people to take advantage of any vaccine that they develop for COVID. I said, the issue to that is, how in the world will you get 300 million people who would even right. begin, <laughs> especially if it's anything that involves any of, a, of an invasive nature? So it's right. saying, yeah. So there are similarities, but there also are very different dimensions as well. And how we weave those things together is going to be important. I think about it in terms of being important too, just in terms of sustaining the credibility uh, of uh, an institution like Meharry. I think there's sure. one level upon which you get some unlikely suspects because of the institution that's providing the testing. Right. But another right. level, you don't want to do anything that compromises what ends up being the trust level of uh, right. I'm, sure, I'm sure that's something that you and Dr. Hills and others are being sensitive to. And I think the rest Absolutely. of us can appreciate it. But I, I do think that we want to make sure we continue to take advantage of the benefit of those relationships that are important as we go further down the road, where the intersection of these issues are not as clear cut. Thank you, Reverend Sanders. Um, just quickly, and again, very much in its formative stages, um, but. Um, we're, the third project that we're working on developing is formulating technology strategies to bridge the digital care divide. So again, um, back to Chuck's point about where in this crisis that has impacted so many people, there may be opportunity to leverage um, new funding uh, and new opportunity for access to care through telemed telehealth te telemedicine but that isn't reaching the populations that um, need that access. Um, right. So using we health workers to re-engage those lost to care and target those at high risk for being lost to care. So again, that's that um, objective that um, this project aligns with. Yeah. And that uh, to, to Reverend Ed's point earlier that 
speaks to the, you know, the, this crisis has exacerbated the digital divide, you know, the haves and the have nots, it's, 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 it's clear. And uh, even through the, uh, everyone is shifting over to telemedicine. Uh, our clients are uh, particularly non-responsive to uh, telemedicine uh, as it stands. Um, our, our providers are, are struggling with trying to get uh, telemedicine visits with our folks, but uh, they, they, they're just, we're still, really hands-on uh, at MCWC as it stands. There are a couple of different ways that we're uh, thinking about approaching this, especially using our community health workers as digital navigators, because so much of this is the uh, what they call digital literacy and uh, access and such. But there are so many nuances to this. So we know that as we increase access, we also have to be responsible stewards. So this is a, an idea about uh, up training our community health workers. They're already trained in, in, in a lot of different areas, but of training our community health workers with uh, digital literacy. And there are, again, like Julie said, um, some available funds that weren't necessarily available in this area three or four months ago that we may be able to leverage in this context and really bolster our train to trainer model. So that's a, I, this is, you know, we're trying to, th these ideas are all doable uh, with a little bit of fancy footwork. And um, we think that they're uh, relatively uh, cost sensitive. So the other deliverables that the um, work group has been com have been committed to uh, with the time frame set as a November 19th advisory council meeting um, for one reason, just because um, that is uh, the end of the year when typically um, work groups would uh, be, be come to formally present to the advisory council and provide um, updates. So um, the other deliverables include formulating and presenting recommendations on the equity performance metrics and um, the metrics for inclusion to inform the advisory council nomination and recruitment process. And um, going forward, um, just in terms of uh, the advisory council, <clears throat> Role and what we're asking um, from the advisory council is, um, you know, of course, we're going to continue to develop these projects out and, and looks at, at those risks and dependencies for um, success and, and may pivot, but um, to just continue to be advisors um, to the work group as we move forward. Um, once, you know, projects are beginning implementation to um, particularly if we're asking all organizations to be on board, such as the one that um, Claire and, and um, Lauren Brown are, are um, leading, to lead the change in their or own organization for those things and to serve as champions, um, to advise on change management and the messaging around that for um, the work group, um, for our communication purposes, help us find funding if we are hitting roadblocks ourselves and you know we'll try not to come to you with that too much but um, <laughs> and um communication with the community so um to provide that messaging um when when there's that opportunity to the community and to city leaders I think we're ready to move on to the next item on the agenda, unless anybody has any further comment here. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is um, reconvening that coordinating committee. So, um, you know, we got hit with COVID and that's obviously changing how we work. And in March, um, I was gonna come to you with a proposal for forming additional work groups. Um, but it seems now just given the changes and, you know, the ability to kind of go out and develop the relationships to pull into a work group, um, that the, the order of convening the coordinating committee would make more sense at this point. Um, that was the same, kind of that same level that existed during the planning period. Y'all had a great model and it's very easy to follow. So um, serving at that intermediary level between the work groups and the council, 
um, but also to help us as we're trying to figure out how we need to pivot in response to COVID. Um, the coordinating committee can can help advise on that as well. Um, so the coordinating committee will probably include some of the people, obviously some of the people who were involved in the coordinating committee, um, the first go around and bring some new faces in as well. Um, with the expectation that it will be diverse in terms of demographics and the skills and experiences necessary to implement the plan. Um, they'll be charged with revisiting the plan to determine how priorities need to be reorganized in response to the impacts of COVID. Um, and then forming out of the, the committee, um, out of the coordinating committee, the additional work groups. And we'll be recruiting um, the chairs and co-chairs for the additional work groups from the coordinating committee. Um, and our ask to you today is if you have any recommendations for who should be included in this group, and if you yourself are interested in being on the coordinating committee, um, to please reach out um, to me after the meeting and let me know who you're thinking of. Is there any discussion on that before we move on to the next sub bullet? Okay. So we really wanted to use this opportunity to get feedback um, that would help the coordinating committee move forward and to use the advisory council um, to get input that would inform how the coordinating committee moves forward. Um, so they're going to be using um, with the ETE plan, these two tools that we're going to show you um, that were sent to you before the meeting as well. The journey map, um, which is just a strategic planning tool for uh, crisis situations um, that was developed uh, by policy Saul. And then the strategy triage tool, which um, was developed by the Center for Community Investment. And these um, will inform kind of how we strategically think about how to reorganize priorities and how to um, adapt to COVID. So the questions that are circled here are the ones that we were wanting to collect advisory council input on today um, to take that information to the coordinating committee once they're formed. Um, and the first question being put out um, to the advisory council is um, what has changed related to our priority problem in the context of the COVID crisis moment? And feel free, just there's a small enough group. I think you can just unmute yourself and say who you are and, and respond. So technology is one example. Oh, is somebody gonna jump in? No. <laughs> so technology is one example that that you know, um, Tariq landed on and, and got me in a big rabbit hole on the digital divide and why health isn't included in that conversation more. Um, I went pretty deep, I came back out. Um, <laughs> determined to have health at the table when we're talking about the digital divide. Um, but, you know, I think just the people at the table, you're seeing things at a, at a, a different level than, than we are. Um, yeah, I, I would just on the point of the digital divide, you know, some of the uh, consideration that is being given to how to reopen schools is very much being driven by this issue of the, uh, the digital divide and the increasing uh, gap that's represented there. And one of the things I think is most significant is on one level, you could say, well, that's the a, a younger population. Well, the younger population is where you would think there might be a greater likelihood of there being some uh, a knowledge base that was greater. But the fact is, uh, in many instances, we're talking about trying to address parents uh, right. who are still within the age ranges that um, we would have hoped there would be some greater evidence of that divide uh, being closed some. But the fact is, it's seemingly as though it's being uh, expanded even greater. So um, I'm saying that to say, 
the evidence is that um, we would probably need to think about how to apply some new applications of the of, of the digital and the technological availability because the fact is there are a lot of opportunities in terms of the fact of just people who carry these gadgets around in their pockets that you know mm -hmm. end up being our smartphones but it's amazing how little those kinds of devices have been developed in terms of trying to be used for purposes like this so one of the things we might want to pay attention to is whether or not there are folks who are dealing with the basic uh, agenda of understanding how we translate, you know, that uh, computer in our pockets into something that might help us in this issue. So I was I had an interesting conversation with one of our providers yesterday, um, who's been doing a lot of telehealth um, for her um, HIV positive clients and. She said that she was really surprised at how the, there were people that she thought were going to really struggle with using telehealth. And there were there were a lot of people that she thought, I'm not sure this person will have devices that will allow them to engage in telehealth. And she's been really surprised at how many of those people actually benefited the most. Um, and of course, it's it's one of those things that just really varies wildly from person to person. Um, but she was surprised at how many people, um, it was just a lifesaver for them because they didn't have to travel to the clinic. Hmm. They had a smartphone that they knew how to use video on, but getting to their provider visits is just the biggest barrier. So yeah, there, there are certainly a lot of people who telehealth has its own many barriers for, but um, I, I think there are still some opportunities there. Yeah, this is this is Brian, and I, I just want to chime in on that point because there's there's two or three really interesting things that we've picked up that I, I would never have believed before the pandemic. The first of which is um, because Medicare will now pay for telephone as well as video conference calls. Um, as a telehealth visit, and, and before it was only video, and now it's been expanded, um, we're serving lots more seniors, and particularly disabled mm -hmm. seniors and disabled folks, but particularly among communities of color um, than we were before. And I, I think that's important because it's keeping people indoors, which is what we want. The other part is the, uh, the, the, the willingness of our population experiencing homelessness to do, tel to do telehealth visits or phone-based visits um, has been really encouraging. And so I, when we first got into this and it was all gonna be done on Zoom or whatever, I, 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 got, I was just sort of like, okay, yeah, whatever. I've been really surprised, especially now that we're able to do phone-based telemedicine um, at how well that that has worked. I'll say one last thing about this. Um, it really does matter which technology platform you're using. And if you're using um, Doximity or some of those, some one set of results, but if you're using something that like Zoom or Auto or some of those others, you get a very different set of results. And so what we're trying to do is buy a platform that seems to have the most acceptance among pop lower income populations with the, the least amount of digital digital devices. and. If we if we move to that platform, I think this is going to get even better. Uh, let me chime in just quickly because uh, we have we, we have a very different story at at, at Mary Community Wellness Center in terms of just retaining our own clients. So uh, we we are collecting all of this data as well. And uh, eighty, uh, I'm I'm speaking uh, off the top of my head here, but I, uh, around eighty six percent of our clients have smartphones. However, the numbers were much lower. They were in the forties, uh, forty to forty five. Uh, percent of folks that were actually willing to come in. Now, these are the, we've got different folks. Now, we all of our we all of our clients are are in different areas, but especially our Group C clients. That our Group C clients uh, have the most complicated uh, social determinants. Uh, to your point, Peter, telephone is uh, about consistent. They're, they're pretty much even the the telephone to the uh, uh, telemedicine uh, surveys. But our, all of our providers at this point. When, uh, when taking a survey of our providers a week, which we do bi-weekly in terms of responsivity to uh, to telemedicine, they all uh, consistently across the board, our, our clients are not really responding well 
and now we're restricted to Zoom, by the way. We we do just use Zoom. We use Zoom and we use tele uh, tele uh, mm. tele uh, telephone as well. So there has been a little bit of, um, I guess, uh, a few issues, and we're trying to hammer, trying to get down to the qualitative, and trying to get down to the what's and the whys and, and why this isn't happening. But we actually saw what we were surprised to see. We saw a slight uptick in um, face-to-face visits and in out uh, lost to care clients over the last six weeks or so that actually were coming into the clinic. So every, everyone's right. It, we're we're, look, we're seeing a very different story here, and and we're going to have to. The data will have to speak for itself, but I, the answer is what you're saying, Peter, a, a diverse platform that lets you go in a bunch of different uh, directions because what works for one client doesn't necessarily work for the next one. And, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say something that you mentioned, Tariq, about uh, seeing more people coming in for visits. I think that's another. Uh, another point we haven't discussed yet, but I've I've been hearing it from everybody that they're seeing more people who've been lost to care, who are, and they're ready to come back in and start getting care again. And it's an opportunity we definitely don't want to miss. And you know, and they're walking in. They're trying to walk in too, which is kind of clumsy for us right now because that's terrible for us right now. But they're showing up. Folks we haven't seen in two years are, are showing up at the door. Right. But I think a part of that is that we've done a pretty good job in terms of our education with regard to HIV and this transmission, especially with the benefit of PrEP and, you know, the, the triple therapy drugs and everything else that we have now. But that same community has gotten the message of a vulnerability sure. where there are probably people who are showing up in relationship to their COVID concerns in in more significant numbers because uh it you know, as long as you were getting and having access to the new generations of drugs that we have around hiv and, and of course we all know that it has also raised the the level of inquiry significantly because i think all of us were dealing to some degree with the fact of the way in which the uh level of response was waning a bit because of the way in which folks think, well, you know, this is a chronic, chronic progressive disease now. We don't have to, you know, some of the fear, I know a lot of the fear factor uh, has been impacted by that. But now the fear factor is reintroduced when you then suggest that there's a greater vulnerability if you're HIV positive. And um, the fact that, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot more factors that people have a lot less control over that could translate into being impacted and affected with the COVID virus. So it's a, I, I think everything I hear all of us saying, I think though, is it's a, it's a pretty uh, broad spectrum of issues that we have to look at and then figure out how we inject into, especially in situations uh, as, um, you know, we was made reference earlier to the idea that indeed um, we are not keeping certain data in terms of the way in which we are testing people at these drive-through sites. But uh, the fact is that data is at some point going to be a critical part of decision-making for us right. in terms of where we actually use and apply resources uh, as well as how we you know, develop strategies. So um, and this is, I mean, this is a very important conversation. I would be interested, though, you mentioned, Julie, uh, whether or not we would bring our original uh, committee back into uh, the equation in terms of how we might want to look at some of the issues related to uh, to the COVID that, you know, dynamic. And I would suggest to you that, um, you know, we probably ought to be very uh, focused on how it is that we make sure that there is, is representation from within the depths of the community that we are still dealing with the most disproportionately impacted. Because uh, there was a, you know, I, I, I don't in any way uh, think negatively of, of the way in which we, the process was carried out the first time. But I do know that I think more and more we're trying to figure out how to get our, our finger closer to the pulse of people whose vulnerability 
takes on a level of of, of significance now that's really different. Uh, I mean, I, I can't help but just say point blank that I do appreciate that the that the dynamics of the culture of uh, relationships amongst same gender loving people, especially, was such an unbelievable gift in terms of some of the organizing and mobilization that we've experienced around HIV. Uh, in some instances, I'm not sure where we get all of that same level of, of, of relationship that we're talking about in relationship to COVID. So it's, it's two different entities in that regard. Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I finally have been able to get on. This is Sharon Hurt. Uh, I was on by uh, phone when I was in my car, but you could not hear me. And and so I sent uh, Dr. Caldwell a text to tell him to let you all know I was on. And I sent Reverend Ed a text. And <laughs> Reverend Ed, so he hadn't even looked at his phone. You see? <laughs> <laughs> you know better than that. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and I just wanted to say that we too have seen um, the increase in people who had been out of care coming back. But another thing that I have to say is that we also see people who are not abiding by the social distancing and wearing their masks. And I think that's simply because they they really don't have an understanding that this is really real. Many of them are on Facebook and 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 on those smartphones, like you mentioned, Tariq, and they are listening to those messages that are coming through that are saying that this isn't uh, real and it's and even though it may have been something that was uh, created, um, it's still a real thing. I, I had just left a minority caucus uh, webinar that we had Dr. Caldwell, Dr. Uh, Hildreth, and several other panelists on there about the COVID-19. And one of the questions was about people wearing masks and how we can enforce that. And, you know, and, and, and there's no way necessarily for us to enforce it. But, you know, I spoke to them very... Um, naturally like I do in most instances and told them that, you know, my mother said it's better to be safe than sorry. That's right. You have to utilize common sense, even though the likelihood may be that you are not going to get it. Uh, but if you do, it could be fatal. And that's basically what I've had to say to uh, our clients that we uh, see. We had a long line of them yesterday waiting to get food cards and not all of them had on masks. We made sure we took their temperatures before they came in and just started doing those types of uh, activities to make sure that we keep everyone as safe as possible. So I think the education piece is uh, critical to let them know the things that they should do in order to help um, alleviate uh, the transmission of the virus. That's, that's good to know. And I'm happy to work with you too. Sharon, did there are some opportunities for you all to get some PPE over there at um at Street Works, and I'm, I'm happy to work with you on that because you can get you can get some pass out as well. So look, thank look, you I'll, so I'll, much I'll, because because I've been begging the fire chief and sure. uh, Nashville General. I've been going around begging everybody. I purchased some too, but you know this so far and few between, sure, I'm unable sure. to get it. So thank you very very much. I, I, I will. I no, I okay. connect directly with you right after this meeting. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, all right. You got my you number. Know. Uh, I, I, yes, I you do. call the Street Works number. You call the, the two five nine seven six seven six, and, and and Tarsha connect you to me. I get to you. Okay, we'll do. Okay, thank you. All right, Sharon, your comments made me think. Though you you mentioned one word, which uh, I think is is just not, um, it's not a necessarily a viable part of any argument that we make with, with populations most disproportionately impacted. When I think of what I hear from persons who have been most reluctant to adhere to protocols and to have the greatest level of hostility 
towards any idea of enforcement of those protocols is that they've come to be framed as being un-American uh, for the protocols to be enforced. And I yeah. think that's an interesting dynamic in terms mm -hmm. of cultural difference and distinction. Um, it's like, you know, it's my, con I, I, I found it interesting to hear that language in many of the protests uh, <laughs> that have been advanced in terms of efforts to uh, enforce, you know, distancing and all these things. So I think that um, it's, it's, it's where we've been many times before, and I will let it go at this, is that the complexities to the issue as relates to persons most disproportionately impacted, especially in that instance, people of color, there's a way in which uh, there are dynamics at work that have to be looked at in terms that are unique and different because of the degree to which the, um, the buy-in, okay, to what might be a proven positive norm ends up being questioned by people in some instances who end up being most vulnerable. I mean, that this whole idea of saying, you know, uh, it's, it's unconstitutional, you know, it's, you know, un-American, I mean, I've, I've, seen and heard that a lot, but it just tells you where the divide in terms of, you know, consciousness, thought process, belief, trust, all those things that we've been dealing with with HIV. I guess that's how we started this in terms of the question to some degree of how what we, you know, lessons learned from F HIV might have application to, you know, the way in which we responded to COVID. I think those issues that we've had to wrestle with in terms of, uh, yeah, myths and misrepresentations of truth and fears and all of that that we've had to deal with along the way. So uh, I think we have our hands full in terms of mm -hmm. developing the response that we need. But I think a part of what we should do is make sure that uh, we are a part of making sure that the voices are at the table. And, uh, and especially when we can get to the point where those voices are there of a choice that they've made on their own accord. Um, the only necessary incentive that we ought to be looking for is the recognition of the impact that it could have on persons who you might care for the most in life. Mm -hmm. uh, any other, right. incentives, any other incentives could get you less than the answer you're looking for. That's right. That's true I mean, in, that, in that instance. Uh, but I did, since you mentioned incentives, it did um, make me think of something that I, I failed to mention when you all were talking about things that we have been doing in the midst of, of COVID and the incentives. We have, you know, our 3MV that we do, we are now uh, scheduling virtual 3MV, which means that uh, I think people will be in their own places and more comfortable. And with us not utilizing the um, overnight locations where we spent thousands of dollars for that means that we're able to increase our incentive to $200, you know, as opposed to, right, as opposed to the $50. So they can get $200 incentives for them to participate in these uh, in the 3MV program. And that has been approved, mm -hmm. which I think is going to really, really help us reach sure. some of those individuals who would not ordinarily want to come out and give up an entire weekend um, for that experience, but they're going to be able to have a different type of experience and really truly get paid. Um, and, and for those who may have had a reduction in their jobs or, um, a loss of job this uh extra money could be very helpful uh to them so i'm excited about that and and looking forward to see the outcomes of of, of what that brings about for us and to, to make one last point uh, uh also associated with the, the digital divide question kind of to circle back around to, to, to sharon's last point Although the technology is, uh, we're limited in certain areas with it, it is robust in others. So it's important for us to look at where this, what what is working. So perhaps we will, uh, the group, like the group setting, our groups, 
uh, may be really enhanced by being able to go virtual. Although the telemedicine for the direct uh, for the direct telemedicine visit might not be so um, happening so well right now, we have uh, community health workers with uh, mobile phones who can be in the streets um, at a potentially face-to-face -face visit and could facilitate that visit in the interim as they move. So uh, we, we're going to have to just, like uh, like Reverend Ed said, this, our, our, our plate is full. However, I believe that a little bit of innovation and a little bit of uh, fancy footwork uh, will get us there, especially in this special times. I think that we, we actually have a little more opportunity right now than we've ever had before. So I'm actually excited about the crisis. Um, thank you both so much for the robust discussion. Um, and I think you gave really good feedback on, on the last two questions. Um, just looking um, at this last question, we've talked a lot about, you know, how we're going to have to continue to pivot and adapt in response to COVID. Um, but in the meantime, you know, while we're doing all this, um, pivoting and reacting, what do you want to make sure does not get lost? So um, the next question, and I think just to, um, you know, make sure that um, everyone has a chance to speak, I'm going to go back through the alphabetical order, if you all will um, allow me to do so and um, pose that question to each one of the council members, um, which is, what do you wanna make sure does not get lost in implementation of the ETE plan, EHE plan, as we move forward um, in, in the time of COVID? Um, so Claire, you're alphabetically first, would you? Sure. Um... So one thing that occurred to me when I was looking through um, our prioritizations was um, there was in goal one, objective three, um, one of the actions is to increase access to free at home HIV testing kits paired with counseling and referral service information. And something that's mm -hmm. about that is that right now, um, especially when it comes to prep, um, a lot of providers are not having their um, prep patients come in for their regular visits um, and not even coming in to get labs done um, just to sort of help to keep them safe. And a lot the, the prep provider I was speaking to the other day said, the one thing I really don't wanna go without is an HIV test. I really need to make sure that those folks are still negative while they're contributing. Sure. Test. And the best way to do that right now is home testing. And it's something I don't think we've made use of in the past. And I think that um, for a lot of really good reasons, some providers are hesitant about home testing. And, you know, the idea that someone would find out that maybe they have a positive um, test when there's nobody around to support them or educate them and talk them through it. Um, so th there are reasons why I think people are nervous about home testing, but I, I think there's, this is the perfect example of a good time and place for it. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, great um, point. Dr. Bullock, you're next alphabetically, and of course everybody also can say pass and think on it and come, come back to with an email later if you have additional feedback. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Um, so I think, you know, obviously with, with everything that's going on, I think the, the piece that we don't want to lose, you know, priority in is just, just our momentum in general. I, I know we've got a lot of moving pieces going on and everybody has a lot of other kind of um, extra activities right now. But I think if we can, you know, really kind of kind of pick and choose between that list that we did and really kind of prioritize those, just continuing that momentum, even if it is for a small number of items that we can at least continue to keep those moving and then branches we, you know, as time continues to evolve and change a little bit more. But I think that's probably the biggest thing. So not one or two in particular, it's not one or two specific things, it's just 
gaining the momentum and continuing the momentum to do those things that we have chosen to prioritize. Fair enough. And thank you. Brian? Oh, you're muted. Thank you. I want to second what Claire was saying about HIV testing. I, I think all of us that are doing work around uh, the PrEP, uh, making sure that pa uh, patients may maintain their adherence to PrEP when we really can't do the serology that we're nor we normally would do, it's it's nerve wracking. I, I think it's a it's essential at the moment. But what are the workarounds that we need to do? And it, it doesn't really stop with HIV. I mean, one of the things that we all worry about are what about all the asymp asymptomatic STIs that people may may contract and that make them more susceptible to HIV infection subsequently. So when this is over, boy, we're going to have fun with chlamydia and we're going to have, yeah. gonna have to hit it. And, so it just, and because if we don't, we're going to have a, a, a much wider sort of outbreak of all of those STIs that, again, put people at higher risk of the, of the, the thing that we're trying to end right now. Great point. Thank you for that feedback. Um, Council Member Hurt. Uh, you know, I don't think I have really anything <clears throat> to add. I agree with Dr. Bullock and, and the things that Dr. Hill has said. Um, the first thing that came to my mind was the progress that has been made. And, and we have to keep focused and get it done. And just like with uh, COVID, with HIV, which I have to admit that Streetworks has not been able to do, but we've just got to test, 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 test. You know, test, trace, and treat, you know, and make sure that we continue to do that and, and get it done. <clears throat> and, and, and I also think that what COVID has done for us, just like us looking at doing a virtual 3MV retreat, we've got to be innovative. We've got to find those ways, think outside of the box, and get, go out there and get those people that we don't have. Because if we don't, then it continues. So that's that's my thing, is let's just continue to work, work very hard, pro provide the kind of care and the services that we know that our clients need. And since we've got many of them who are out, come back to us, let's focus on keeping them you know, do things we need to do so we can make sure that we continue with their services. And one other thing I wanted to add from another question was that we, I've seen some of our clients have go through some, some anxiety, which has put them back out in using drugs, put them back out in those vulnerable situations. And um, and that's been taxing uh, a little. I know, especially on my case managers, because we try to provide such an intimate care. And when they start to get the resistance from those that they have worked with for a year, and now they are back out in the street doing things because they didn't know how to cope. Um, we, we just got to, you know, keep our eyes on the prize, you know. And, and stay with. And Councilman, so one thing that Dr. Caldwell said on a separate call this morning was that mm -hmm. the overdose deaths have doubled uh, over mm -hmm. last year, the past two months. So thank you for exactly. all the work that you're doing. Thank you. And and you know we 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 were destroyed in the um, in the tornado. Our offices were, and I really want to thank everybody because all of you all reached out to us in some way and said. Um, just let me know what I could do to help. And I didn't want to tell you that I need you to come over here and wipe these tears out of my eyes because I was excited. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but now we're still looking for another location because where we are now is temporary and we've got to find another location. And with our needle exchange, you know, that's very hard when you've got sure. parks and schools and, yeah. <clears throat> you know, different types of venues that is, um, you know, a thousand feet within. Mm -hmm. our, so we won't be able to, you know, do the exchange. But we've been going out doing it. We've been more mobile 
than before. Whereas, you know, when we were in that other location, we had quite a few uh, people coming to our office. So it's going to challenge us a little bit, but but we'll get it done. Thank, Thank you, you, Brian. Um, Brady, you're next on the list. Um, I was just going to say, we had our um, my, uh, our first planning council meeting uh, this past Tuesday uh, since COVID and the tornado. And I was very encouraged, um, like we've already heard here today, uh, about the re-engagement of people lost to care. But I was also very excited to hear about the, the strengthening and the expanding of some safety nets due to our ASOs and CDOs reaching out to, and making collaborations with other nonprofits throughout the city. Um, and because of some collaborations that hadn't hadn't existed before, um, that was very encouraging to hear. Um, one thing that we also probably want, need to keep on our radar. Um, one thing I'm worried about is food. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of our our agencies are are just flying through their food budgets for the year. Um, so, so something uh, we need we need to be keeping a, uh, an eye on that. And one thing that I think that this epi or this pandemic really put a focus on, um, and I know we've mentioned it before in the past, but it really, it, I mean, it's hard to to stay safer at home when you have no home, and it's putting a uh, an even bigger highlight on the need for um, um, economical housing um so but uh other than that uh i'll tell y'all personally um as someone living with hiv in this community during these times um this has been hard uh like like we've been saying like i've been hearing um all throughout it, it's been it's been a little rough but uh i'm appreciative of people like sharon and and edwin uh dr uh, reverend sanders out there doing the work um Thank you guys. And just know that the council is here. Anything that we can do. Um, mm -hmm. I should, should say that we were we were given um about a, a million dollars, a little less than a million dollars through the CARES Act, um, through Ryan White Part A. And that money is being uh, going out, I can say mostly to PPE um and that type stuff is what that's going to um to the ASOs that that put in the contracts and request it. But um None of those announcements are, are have been finalized or anything yet. It's I've only seen this line item type thing of what was requested. Most of it PPE, technology enhancements, um, and that type thing. Um, but just know the council's here and we're willing to do anything we can to help. Thank you so much, Brady. Um, Reverend Sanders. Sure. Let me just say. Um, I really appreciate the quality of this conversation because I think that I have heard from perspectives that end up being a part of that mosaic of coverage that we need to have right now. Everything from what you were just saying about the planning council to the experiences that, um, you know, Sharon Hurt and the people in the street works are talking about, you could go around. Uh, I want to throw in two little things because I'm always trying to figure out little things we can do to get people to take uh, ownership or have some recognition of their own self. People are still reluctant to situations where they are in uh, uh, invasive, they have invasive concerns, like a lot of the new ways in which people can check your temperature. But I have been uh, surprised to find out the number of people that do not have a thermometer. Uh, it's it's amazing. Uh, there's an education that you can do that just helps people to understand how they might begin to uh, read that kind of indicator uh, and give you reason to begin to think about and maybe even give you reason to raise questions where there are avenues where questions can be raised that you don't have to necessarily be disclosing in any sense, but you know, it just means that it's a tool. It's another tool that uh, it would probably help us to figure out how to equip more and more people with in our communities. And I think that um, that um, where we are right now is um, at a place where uh, there's it's optimal opportunity. Uh, but I think a part of that opportunity is gonna require a revisiting 
of the ways in which we have done any and everything in the past. Because what might have been uh, effective in relationship to a lot of the work we've done around HIV um, will have at least different application, if, if not the same, uh, as we try to deal with COVID. So um, I, I think we're doing the right thing to be talking about how we are using and taking advantage of lessons learned and, uh, and understanding how to most effectively apply them and taking advantage of these uh, new found uh, commitments to relationships. Uh, it, it is the case that some people showed up uh, who had not shown up before uh, in the midst of the aftermath of the tornado. And then of course, the subsequent reality of COVID. But I do think that uh, we need some real expertise and some thought and some training around how we sustain that. Uh, it's it's kind of like what we deal with all the time in biomedical research initiatives that, you know, make sure that the community doesn't just end up being a laboratory, but really ends up being a partner. And I think we've got an opportunity to create some new partnerships that could have impact even beyond COVID. Yeah, and our realities with HIV. Thank you, Reverend Sanders. Uh, Fahad? Hey, um, you know, I've been reflecting on this idea of, a, of in so many different ways because a lot of the things that we do to take care of patients have dramatically decreased while we know that the disease burden is still there. So from a public health perspective, I'm really concerned about the general anxiety being disproportionate to the other health related risks that people are exposed to because of um, because the way the pandemic has impacted folks. And so what I do think is a positive is this appreciation for the importance of health and certain practices being a different self expectation and caring for others expectation that has been a focus of some of what um, has been required of the last two and a half months. So we've always talked about the culture of health in the context of public health literature and public health practice and public education. I think that has taken on a different kind of general communication um, avenue than just the public health literature and those of us that are in the weeds in this work. And my hope is that framework of incorporating the culture of health and practices for myself and to protect others becomes a way we can start to reframe um, a lot of different health practices that have not gotten the attention prior to the pandemic that now maybe through the pandemic allows people to engage differently than they have in the past. Um, on a personal level, uh, you know, we talked, we heard earlier about the increase in serology testing that's going to be happening. And I'm hoping that we can create more transparency around data as re related to the um, viral load in the community. And as a result, create a culture where we pay attention to the viral load in the community, not just with COVID, but more broadly, that we're all in this together and we have to be transparent about the viral load in the community and the hotspots where we see that. So um, my focus right now is all about how do we make sure this culture of health starts to assimilate into the thinking of our community in a way that um, the pandemic has forced, that might be the silver lining and how we learn as a society how to appreciate health and um, disease better and become more informed. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, Dr. Bullock, I know we're a little bit over time, but I think you had the last agenda item. Sorry, Julie, I'm walking. I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, if you guys, I don't have any additional announcements. Um, does anybody have any announcements of any upcoming events or activities um, related to the advisory council that we need, need to be made aware of? I've seen a lot of shaking heads now. I, I think okay, if yeah, if not, um, 
we'll kind of, I think that's everything that we have on the agenda today. I think we can go ahead and move to adjourn. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank a wonderful you. week. Bye -bye.